Hello and welcome to Thanet Writers meets Nigel West, uh, author of several books on intelligence and security matters, um, uh, including Spycraft Secrets and Espionage A to Z. Now Nigel has also been voted uh, expert of experts by a panel of fellow writers in The Observer, um, so I think that's fairly well credentialed from that point of view. Nigel. So Nigel, welcome to Thanet Writers. Um, we're very glad to have you here. Now, I want to start, Nigel, with Perhaps something that's quite well known in your literary um, history about Garbo um, the, that you're quite well known for. Um, that actually you found Garbo and you tracked him down um, when many others had failed, I think. Uh, I'm not sure that anybody else had bothered to look. Oh, because, no, okay. Because well, the textbook said that he he died years ago in Angola of, of malaria. Right. Well, how, how then, what, what sparked you off actually going on this hunt to find him and how did you do it? Well, uh, I first read about Garbo in 1972, and he was an extraordinary figure because he had had this huge influence over the Second World War. He'd created this imaginary espionage network that had been supplying information, fabricated, deliberately fabricated information back to the Germans. And he had persuaded the Germans on the day before the D-Day landings that the landings were going to take place in Normandy but that they could be ignored because these were a diversionary feint and the real invasion was going to take place two weeks later in the Pas de Calais. So this was really quite extraordinary. And he also completely invented an entire army called the First United States Army Group that supposedly was based in East Anglia and was concentrating in this area to embark in Dover to go across to the Pas de Calais. And all of this, of course, fed into German military doctrine, because if you want to deliver 160,000 troops across the English Channel, take the shortest route. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and also, if you take the shortest route, then you've got the maximum amount of time for aircraft to be able to fly over the combat zone and then rearm and refuel short distance be back on duty of the combat zone, be active. So there were lots of advantages to taking the shortest route, so that was, that was obvious. So Garbo was simply telling the Germans what they expected to hear, and they, and they believed him. And I started to look for this spy uh, in 1972. I don't think there were, there were other people looking for him, but, but nobody knew his real name, and it, it took me 12 years to find him. Well, I mean, um, when you found him, I mean, was he? What was his reaction to you? To you approaching him in the first place? So, what was, was he surprised? Was he alarmed? <laughs> well, um, I approached him in, a, in an unorthodox way. In 1944, because of what he had contributed to the war, he had been given a medal that had never been gazetted properly, and he had never been he had never attended an investiture. He had been handed the medal by the Director General of the Security Service, the head of MI5, Michael Sir David Petrie, at that time. And it was all in conditions of great secrecy because he was a double agent. Yeah. So nobody really knew about this. So in 1984, when I thought that I had found him, he was then living in Caracas. And I wasn't certain about what his reaction would be if I just approached him out of the blue and said, can you tell me about a double agent code named Garbo? I, you know, anything could happen. So what I did was that I approached Buckingham Palace, told a, a fib, I hope the Buckingham Palace isn't watching, <laughs> uh, told a slight fib and said that for the 40th anniversary of the D-Day landings, which were coming up in June 1984, that Garbo was going to emerge from the shadows and was going to attend the celebrations. Now, Buckingham Palace said, well, that's amazing. He's dead, isn't he? So, and the Duke of Edinburgh is very keen on spies. And uh, when I persuaded them that he was coming to London, Duke of Edinburgh said, well, he must come to Buckingham Palace and we must have an investiture and he must have his medal. So that solved the problem for me because my next telephone call was to Caracas when I 
called Juan Pujol Garcia. And so they're calling from Buckingham Palace. Would you like to come to London to receive your medal? But only if I've got the right person. Are you the double agent for the Second World War, codenamed Garbo? And there was 10, 12, 15 seconds while he thought about this. And I was terrified I'd got the wrong person. And ultimately he said, you have the right person, but I am only going to meet you in New Orleans. And so we had to agree uh, I went to New Orleans. And it turned out that uh, his son had been, was then a student, medical student at Tulane University, who had been the victim of racial abuse. Uh, Juan had subsequently married um, a black woman in Venezuela. And so their son, their sons, plural, were of mixed race. And the younger son, Juan Jr., uh, was very dark, but had a white girlfriend. And she had suffered racial abuse from some rednecked southern women uh, in uh, Louisiana. And the consequence of that was that Juan Jr. had been very upset by this overt uh, hostility and racism, which he'd never experienced or understood in Venezuela. And he had told his father, and his father had wanted to say to him, wanted to build him up and to uh, say, you are a valuable individual and you are worth any American. And as a matter of fact, I saved during the Second World War tens of thousands of American lives. But he couldn't say that because he knew his son wouldn't believe him. So when I met Garbo in New Orleans, uh, I said, I'm delighted to meet you. He said, tell my children what I did in the Second World War. And so my job was to tell his children about his wartime service. Uh, and that is what made it all possible. So you'd won his trust by, by that by that story that you had to tell of him to his children that, that was you were that verifiable source. It, and I, I was the trusted individual who told the children about their father, but he couldn't tell them that because they would, they would never believe him. <laughs> of course. But, but they accepted it from me and then because I had done that, Juan was willing to participate in, in declaring himself as having been this wartime double agent. Oh, yeah, that's just fascinating to see that you had that, that influence. And actually, I think that's something I want to, I want to talk about. But it was unintended. I, mean, I had no idea when I called Juan in Caracas that there was this turmoil going on in his family in the background. So it's sort of luck, it was sort of just doing the right thing at the right time. Which I suspect sometimes is perhaps what some intelligence work may be about, perhaps. Sometimes <laughs> people make their own luck. I, I, I would agree, yes, absolutely. Which actually, and, and, and with what you say there, I, it's something I want to touch on more, more genuinely with making your own luck, maybe, or intelligence work, because it's something interesting, more fundamentally, does intelligence work work, if you pardon the expression, you, you know, it, it, is intelligence community an effective part of our national identity, or our, our, our arm of our government? It, it, is it an effective resource? Well, every minister, when they're appointed, if they have responsibility for an intelligence agency, will say, will call in their chief or their director general and say, are you providing value for money? And the, the joke is that the director general or the chief of the security service or the head of uh, GCHQ will lean over and say, oh yes, minister, we're doing a really good job, but it's so secret we can't tell you how successful we are. And, and so there is a, an element of suspicion about what they do. But, but the truth is, and it, it's something in, I think, the national character, we're damn good at it. Uh, we have a very small cadre of operational officers in MI5, in SIS, and in GCHQ. But when you look at the impact of what has been accomplished before and during and after the Second World War, 
it, it is astonishing. Bletchley Park made an incredible contribution to the pro successful prosecution of the Second World War. Um, during the Cold War, we ran really good uh, sources. Um, in Northern Ireland, we beat the provisional IRA by penetrating a terrorist organization that was thought to be impossible to uh, penetrate. Um, and we've, we've done a large uh, amount of interdiction with uh, terrorist organizations and cells in the United Kingdom, jihadis, um, that don't hit the headlines. I think that's interesting because when intelligence does hit the headlines, it's normally for negative reasons. You, you, you think to uh, WMDs, to the Falklands War, to the, these, these Berlin Wall, the, the, the so-called failures of the intelligence service. I mean, do you think that criticism is, is warranted? Um, well, it, uh, two things to be said about that. First of all, anybody writing a history of the intelligence agencies, if they if they don't have access to the files, if they don't have access to the personnel, then they're reliant on the newspaper cuttings. And by definition, a really successful intelligence operation is never going to be known because you're going to want to repeat it. So, particularly in America, you see that the histories of the CIA are just catalogues of failures because they're operations, high-risk operations, that have gone wrong. They've been sanctioned operations, but it just simply didn't didn't work out. And so that's a, a big problem. Uh, the second issue is that when people look at intelligence agencies, it, it's very hard to get an overall global picture of, of what they do and how they operate. And so you don't get a, a true sense until you've got inside the organization. And then you understand that an intelligence agency is not there to predict the future. It's not there to tell you this is what is going to happen. What they'll give you is, you hope, an accurate snapshot of what is happening now. And then it's up to the policy makers to draw their own conclusions. Right. I mean, so in that, in that sense, from your, your perspective, I mean, you've, you've studied this, it's been a lot of times work for you in, in, in that sense, and it's one of your, your, your main focus, focuses. From your experience, what, what are the best and what are the worst intelligence agencies? And what, Jeremy, you mentioned the catalogue of failures with, with say, the CIA, for example, would you rate them more negatively than, for example, MI5 or, or the French agencies? Or I mean, what, what, what's your view on intelligence agencies? Well, it, it's very hard to judge an intelligence agency. and You've got to set out the criteria that you're going to judge their performance by. So, do they attract defectors? Do they run good operations? Uh, do they maintain secrecy? Um, all of those are going to be factors in how you judge an agency. Now, if you apply those uh, criteria across the globe, oddly enough, probably the most successful intelligence agency of all time, which has been in existence since 1883, continuously, this is a clue, staffed by British personnel until 1947, has never been penetrated is the Delhi Intelligence Service. It's never been penetrated? No. So, uh, oddly enough, uh, the Indian Intelligence Service is very widely regard highly regarded because it's been hugely successful. And when you look at it, its history, if you go back to the period up until 1947, it's a very small group of Brit 300 British officers effectively ran India. I mean, they had sources in every village, they had advance notice of, of every mutiny, of every demonstration, of every strike. Uh, anything that they had a representative in every single village in India. And so uh, the Delhi Intelligence Bureau, called the DIB, is very highly regarded and continues to this day. That's interesting. You, you, you mentioned there about penetration, about penetration of security services, and obviously one of the hostile penetration. Uh, hostile penetration. Thank you of, of intelligence services, and one of the, perhaps the most well-known uh, penetrations in British circles is, of course, the Cambridge Five. That is, it has become quite well known. I mean, I, I'd be interested to know from from your from your work, your studies. I mean, I, I don't know whether you ever ever met any of the, the Cambridge Five, or I mean, your experience of them. Were they were they as much of a national threat? 
at the time as we now understand them to be? Were they a cohesive whole? Were they five single individuals? I mean, what, what's, what's your thoughts on them? Well, the Cambridge Five, uh, uh, Burgess MacLean, Philby Blunt and Ken Cross, did I know any of them? Uh, I knew Anthony Blunt uh, quite well and interviewed him at length. I knew John Cancross very well and ghosted his autobiography. Uh, Kim Philby I never knew, uh, but I know his widow Rufina uh, pretty well. And I never met either Burgess uh, or Maclean. So um, I have a knowledge of the Cambridge Five. Uh, did they do tremendous damage? John Cancross was working in the cabinet office for Lord Hankey in 1940 when the first uh, decisions were being made by the War Cabinet about pursuing a miniaturized atomic weapon. And that, the, uh, the Fresh Piles formula, which then was reported on, became known as the Maud Report, was actually written, drafted, written and typed by John Cancross. So that, a copy of that report was on Stalin's desk pretty much before it, it was presented to the War Cabinet in England. And I think that you could argue that that was the beginning of atomic espionage. And it, it, it alerted the Soviets to the existence, the potential for miniaturized weapon. We talk about nuclear weapons for a very long period, but they would have been about the size of a cargo ship. They were not practical as a weapon. The issue was miniaturization. Fresh and Piles were the two physicists who came up with a formula and said, you know, it might be possible to create a weapon way a ton, ton and a half, but you, we could get that into the air and we could drop it on a target. And that was the first time that a nuclear weapon was taken seriously. I mean, H.G. Wells had written about, uh, about nuclear weapons. So the Cambridge Five had a direct impact on atomic weapons. I mean, Nigel, this is... It's fascinating. I genuinely could talk to you for another couple of hours about this because it's absolutely genuinely fascinating. Stuff. I, however, I'm conscious that time is time is short. I must ask you one last question, if I may, about your actual your your, your craft, your craft of writing. When you sit down to craft your work, your 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 heavily researched books that you've created, how how do you approach that that research, that writing? What what comes first, the idea, the the the, the, the rigour of writing, say, nine to five, or is you have to, I mean, what, what, what is your, your routine? I'm not bothered about the, the writing itself. Um, my heart goes out and my admiration goes to people who write fiction because they have this very awkward individual sitting on their shoulder called a reader <laughs> who is whispering in their ear saying, uh, suspended disbelief, I don't think so, you'll never get away with that. I don't care about that because what I write, I've researched and I know it's true, and I don't really care whether my reader believes it or not. It will be so detailed, I won't just say that it happened in London, I'll say that it happened in this particular street, this is the number of the building where it happened, and this is the floor where the decision was taken. So my books are, I think they've been described as numbingly detailed. <laughs> They're not textbooks, some of them are textbooks, but they are really detailed in order to prove that this is 100% authentic information. This is not speculation. This isn't an unnamed source told me or Major X, who's too secret to be identified, said that. This is absolute fact. And therefore, what I'm doing is I'm writing it down in, in, in a narrative form that I hope is readable. But you know what? I don't really care about my reader. What I care about is getting the facts accurate and getting them in there. Well, that's that's fine. And again, Nigel, I've got so many questions I haven't even begun to touch on. And, and I, I read the book. I, I, I read the book, and that will that will help you answer. So, but it, hopefully, we can arrange another uh, meeting with you at some point so I can ask some, be some more questions. That'd be fantastic. Thank you. Well, Nigel, thank you so much for your time today. We're very grateful to, to have you along. So. My thanks to Nigel West for his time interviewing us today and our chance to quiz him on some of his, his knowledge and his secrets, his knowledge, his information. Um, so 
I'm Matthew Munson, and on behalf of Talent Writers, thank you for watching. Goodbye.